So my charge is to um, talk about the hepatic and extrahepatic complications of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and steatohepatitis. And I'm going to focus on a few basic concepts, the risk of overall mortality, the risk of cancer, and the risk of heart disease and cardiovascular-related mortality in patients with fatty liver disease. So the natural history of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is quite variable, and it is important to emphasize that although this is an extremely common disease, with estimated prevalences of up to 30 to 40 percent, the majority of these patients are actually quite stable, and in fact, population-based studies from Scandinavia uh, and in the U.S., as I'll show you, suggest that patients with NAFLD who do not have significant fibrosis or advanced disease are not necessarily at increased risk of overall mortality. Now, a unknown percentage of these patients go on to develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is associated with cytolytic, cytopathic changes, such as hepatocellular ballooning, and presumably some of those patients will then go on to develop progression of fibrosis, and therefore may have complications related to progressive fibrosis in the liver, and an unrecognized and somewhat unclear subset will go on to develop cirrhosis that may be obviously related to NASH, where the features of NASH are present on histology, or may be associated with no features of NASH or steatosis or ballooning, and may be left with a diagnosis of cryptogenic cirrhosis. And I think we need to keep in mind every time we evaluate a patient with cryptogenic cirrhosis, whether they have underlying risk factors for metabolic syndrome. Now, some of these patients with NASH, despite the fact that, as you just saw, we don't have a pharmacologic magic bullet, may regress or stabilize their disease based on lifestyle changes and other changes, and hopefully we will have more options for these patients. And finally, a subset of these patients will go on to develop cancer. So one of the first points to remember is what are the risk factors for disease progression that we can identify in identifying which patients should be offered a liver biopsy, more aggressive counseling, or consideration of bariatric surgery, et cetera. So the non-modifiable risk factors that are associated with progression of the disease include older age, generally greater than 50, race, especially Mexican-American ancestry is associated with a higher rate of progression, Genetic background, the PNPLA3 gene has been found to be associated with fatty liver if found in a particular polymorphism. And the baseline histology, if there is a higher level of fat, inflammation, and ballooning, they're more likely to progress. Weight gain, insulin resistance, and diabetes obviously are central features. So if the patient is over 50 years of age and obese or has type 2 diabetes, the prevalence of bridging fibrosis, as shown in two papers, one of which by Dr. Angulo, is 66%. So in our practice, we generally stratify the patient based on age, presence or absence of type 2 diabetes, and that alone will help us decide who we need to consider a biopsy for, especially if the liver enzymes are elevated. Now, not all obesity is the same. This is a paper that we published several years ago from the N. Haynes 1 data set showing that those with central obesity are more likely to have cirrhosis-related death or hospitalization. The power of the N. Haynes data set is that we can capture follow-up and outcomes in the large number of patients that were seen, and we have similar data now with N. Haynes 3. Whereas patients with non-central or peripheral obesity are not likely to have a greater increase of cirrhosis-related death or hospitalization. So the pattern of obesity is very important. This is a study from Dr. Harrison, who's in the audience and will be speaking. And you can see here that uh, although there's a lot of information on this slide, a huge number of patients, over 800 patients, with fatty liver versus NASH, varying degrees of fibrosis, you can see that as the patients have advanced fibrosis, their liver enzymes tend to be elevated. They tend to be much more likely to have diabetes, hypertension, and older age, suggesting greater features 
or worsening features of metabolic syndrome. There is a growing recognition that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease may be a much more important problem in patients with NAFL, and we may need to become endocrinologists and cardiovascular physiologists if we really want to offer proper treatment for these patients. Heart disease is much more common than liver disease as a cause of death in patients with NAFL, as shown in this one study with 400 patients. Ischemic heart disease accounts for 25% of the deaths compared with 13% for liver disease. In another study with over 800 patients with suspected non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the single most important cause of death was cardiovascular, and the mortality rate in a different study over 11-year median follow-up period was 45% for patients from a cardiovascular cause. So one of the growing recognitions is that cardiovascular disease, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, cancer might in fact be the more important diseases that we need to be concerned about for these patients, especially in the setting of NAFL as opposed to NASH with advanced fibrosis. So in summary, subjects with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease have greater than expected mortality compared to matched controls. So I think that is the answer when we are told by our primary care physicians, partners, or other people saying this is a benign disease, fatty liver has been around for decades, why are you creating a disease where it doesn't exist? Well, you can see very clearly that the mortality that is observed versus expected in patients with NAFLD is greater than control population, and just by recognizing simple risk factors for mortality such as older age, diabetes, and cirrhosis, you can see that death from malignancy, 28%, ischemic heart disease, 25%, and liver disease, 13% in this population. So this is not a truly benign disease.